This is 18-year-old Carla Wolker. Carla was a senior in high school in the year 1974. She did her best to get good grades and was described as a very happy and kind-hearted person. Carla had begun dating a fellow student named Rodney McCoy, and together they would attend a Valentine's Day dance. After spending some time at the dance, they decided to leave and go to the local bowling alley where other people their age would hang out. The couple would park their car outside of the bowling alley, not knowing that they were about to be attacked by a very angry and drunk man. So let me, let me just start by talking. We're not going to ask you anything until when we say two things first, okay? Um, we're here because we are looking into the murder of Carla Walker. And we've done a very thorough investigation. We know what happened, and our evidence has led us to you, okay? There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I know you're confused, but you shouldn't be because we know what happened, okay? Now, this is your opportunity to talk to us, to tell us your side, because I have I have bosses that I have to answer to, and what they want to know is that if you have any regret, if there's, if there's anything that you can tell us that doesn't paint a picture of you that makes you look like a monster, because frankly, right now, when you're talking about a young girl that got murdered, we only have one side, and we'd like to hear yours, okay? So that's, that's why we're here today. Okay. We don't. We know what happened, but we'd like to hear from you if there's anything. We, hold on. Hold on. Okay. All right. Before we go any further, though, okay, I gotta read something to you, just like in the movies. This is Glenn McCurley, and in 1974, on the same night that Carla and Rodney parked outside of the bowling alley, he was driving around in his truck and drinking hard alcohol. His search for a victim to kidnap would lead him to park at the bowling alley. That's when he would notice Carl and Rodney making out in their car. Glenn would walk over to their vehicle, open the door, and point his handgun at Rodney and pull the trigger three times. The gun would not fire, so Glenn would use it to knock Rodney unconscious. Glenn would then grab Carla and drag her to his vehicle and drive away from the scene. It's up to you. You know, you, you can either talk to me or not, but we'd really like to talk to you today. Then, um, did something to that girl? Yes, sir. I don't think so. You don't think so, what? That I did. I, I don't know. I've never seen the girl or anything. When was I supposed to have done this? Okay. So are you willing to talk to me today about this case? Um, I mean, I don't. The other day when you came. Okay. But are you willing to talk to us today? I mean, it's like I said, it's your right to either speak with us or not. You know, but i got to be clear on whether or not you're willing to talk well, to us. Well, I don't know. I don't know anything about this stuff. Rodney would regain consciousness and inform the police as to what had happened. The police would begin their investigation and they would find a handgun magazine on the ground near the crime scene. The weapon the magazine belonged to would not fire unless it was inserted securely into it. This would explain why Rodney was still alive, but the police had no idea where Carla was. Further investigation would reveal that the day after Carla was kidnapped, Another magazine was purchased at a gun store by a man named Glenn McCurley. The police would interview Glenn about his purchase of the magazine, but Glenn would tell them that he had purchased the magazine because they had been on sale. When they asked if they could see his weapon, he told them that it had been stolen out of his truck while he was fishing one day and he had not reported it because he had a criminal record and he was worried they would not believe him. The police would not have enough evidence to arrest Glenn, so they would continue the search for Carla. That was the last time they would speak to Glenn about the case until the year 2019. That's what the, the, the whole thing was over that I understood. Mr. Kimberly, can you look at that picture and just tell us for sure that you do not know who she is? You've not had any contact with her? I've never seen her before. I don't know who she is. If you stand right beside of me, you say it's what? What's your name? Carla Walker. I've, so you've never met her before, never seen her? I've never seen her, never met her, uh -huh. never talked to her, I wouldn't know her uh -huh. if she was standing beside of me. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But then I'm not, I guess it's not in you. Uh, 
importance anymore. But those there was two guys in pickup, and they I went to check. I had that pistol in under the seat, wrapped up in a cloth, and. Uh, I didn't think anything about it, and everything looked all right. And then later on, I found out that they had stolen that pistol. Mm -hmm. And I told the uh, police that came to talk to it at the time that I didn't have the pistol, that it had been stolen. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see. When, uh, uh, they took me downtown and questioned me and all this and that and I told them exactly what I'm telling you and everything and what happened and uh, they said that they had found a clip mm -hmm. uh, for a 22 pistol and uh, I didn't know anything about it they thought that gun might have been used in the, in, the, in the robbery or something. So they found it and, and... Carla's body would be found three days later in a ditch near a local lake. They would also find DNA on Carla's clothing. But because they did not have the DNA technology that they do today, the evidence would be sealed and the case would be closed until the year 2018. Real quick, she did read to your rights just want to make sure that you understood them and that you're willing to waive your rights. We're not saying you did anything. We just want to make sure you understood those in your way with your rights and willing to talk well, to I us. I don't understand any of that. No. It just basically means that you're willing to talk to us today. Either, either you're willing to or you're not, which I think you are, but we just need to be clear on that, okay? So basically, if, if we talk today then it's because you want to, not because you have to. You don't have to talk to us, but we would like to talk to you. But if well, I, I don't even know when this girl was done that way, or I don't know anything. But before we get into that, we need to know that you understand what Detective Wagner read to you, and that you're waiving those rights and are willing to talk. To well, I had to. That's what I'm trying to get to is how, how you and that other guy. Well, in order for us to discuss this case, you have to be able to, you're going to have to waive your rights to talk to us about it. Otherwise, if you don't waive your rights, we've got to stop. Okay? So it's one or the other. We can talk about it and move forward, which requires you waiving your rights, or we stop. But it's, it's one or the other. So we'd love to talk to you, but again, it's, it's, it's up to you whether or not you want to move further. Do you understand that? That's, that's why we said terminate. If, you, if you're if you not comfortable talking, you can stop the interview. Do you agree to talk to us today, Mr. Curley? I agree. I would agree to talk because I haven't done anything. Okay. okay. But uh, still. It. So you're agreeing to talk to us? I don't know. I agreed to talk to you the other night, mm -hmm. and I told you about my gun, mm -hmm. and you you told me that you were putting me on the suspect of doing something, mm -hmm. just for losing a clip and a gun, because I went down to the store and bought bought another one to replace it, and they came and come and talked to me and asked me if why I bought another clip. I said, well, I bought another clip, I ran into a good price on one. Mm -hmm. And I put. I, I was going to buy another gun, another pistol like that, because it had been stuck. I didn't have one, and that's that's as far as I'm into the whole thing. Okay. I mean, it, it, and you turned it around the other way. I'm not. I mean, that's your job. Well, yeah. We're not trying to confuse you. We're just. We would like to talk about this case with you today, but we need to know that you're okay with talking about. It. Well, I just. I don't know the girl. I've never seen her. So do you want to discuss? I haven't. I haven't killed anybody like I told you the other day. I'm 77 years old and I'm not into that kind of stuff. 
Well, if you'd like to know more details, we just need to know simply if, if you would be willing to talk about this. Well, I don't see how you could have anything on me because I don't have, I don't know anything about it. The police reopened the case after analyzing Carla's clothing and putting the DNA they found into a database. It wouldn't take very long for a match to be found, and they would begin to watch Glenn's home. Eventually, they would see Glenn taking out his trash, and they would find a straw inside that had his DNA on it. Once they had the DNA confirmed, they would ask Glenn to come down to the police station to answer some questions. Glenn would continue to deny ever knowing Carla, and he would stick with the story he told the police over 40 years ago. You're saying I killed somebody, and I, I did you. not. I did not kill anybody. Then what did you do? What do you mean, what did I do? I, I, I don't know what I done. I, I didn't do anything. You kidnapped her. I didn't kidnap anybody. You kidnapped her. But somebody saw me do this? Yes, somebody did see me do this. No. You made a mistake. You left your boyfriend alive. I did not kidnap anybody. Her boyfriend is alive. And he identified me as He's a guy. a living witness. Okay? No. You made a mistake. You I did not alive. do anything you like that. You did. It. You did. Ms. McCurley, this really is your time to be able to get this off your chest. And to if it was on my chest, I didn't do anything like that. After pretending to cry, hoping to gain sympathy, Glenn tells the detective that he was with his wife on the night of the crime. Glenn used this alibi before, so they've already looked into it and they have found that his wife and children were actually out of town when the crime took place. That's what she, she wouldn't go to town. She doesn't. I don't even let her drive. This was 46 years ago. I know. And she, she's still the same way. She doesn't have the reflex of driving. Well, she said she was gone. She said she was out of town just last week when we talked to you. You were right there next to her when she said it. She went out of town to Waco to school down there, and I drove her down there and came back with her every time. She said her dad was had a heart surgery. He had heart surgery here in Fort in Midland. I mean, in Fort Worth. Well, she said she 1974, he was in the hospital. Because you were working. He had work. He had work. Well, if I was working, I was probably on the road driving. Not, not when this happened, you are. Or what? You were off. You worked that day, but you were off that night. When this happened, you were off. <clears throat> I don't know where you get your information. Uh, that, that, that came off your schedule from 1974. Your schedule. Directly right off your work schedule. I didn't, I didn't do that to that girl. Didn't do what? Whatever it was done to her. Because I don't know her. I've never seen her, never talked to her. 
prior to that night. What do you mean? When you're saying you've never talked to her, was that, are you meaning prior to that I've night? I've never been this close to her if she was right there. I don't know her. Did you ever hear about what happened to her back then? I heard some stuff on the news and stuff, but that's... What did you hear? I don't know. I don't remember. Some little girl got killed or something. And uh, I don't... I, don't, I didn't have time to pay attention to those things then. But I was working. I, I, it's not my deal. Mr. McCurley, we're going to step out for a minute. Would you like to have uh, some water, something to drink, soft drink, water? Uh, I guess some water. So we'll get you some water. The detectives would return, and for almost two hours, they would do their best to persuade Glenn to confess to the crime. They would get very close to a confession, only for Glenn to change his mind and continue to claim innocence. After two hours of back and forth, they would finally get Glenn to confess to the crime. His confession, however, was very strange. He starts off trying to be the hero of the night, but at the end, even he knows it doesn't make any sense at all. Were you inside or outside? I was outside. I would parked in the parking lot. It was just people watching? I don't know if it was or not. I heard a girl screaming in the car mm -hmm. over a couple of cars away from me. And uh, I went over there to see if I could help. What you see? There was this big guy. I had her up against the door, jerking her around and this and that kind of stuff. And I opened the car door to help her out got her and put her in my car. When you went to help her out, what, what did you see was going on inside the car? I couldn't tell. If she was, was wrestling against her or something. I don't know. Okay. And uh, she was screaming and yelling. I put her in my car and got her calmed down. And we talked about some things, I don't know, I asked her why he was beating her up or whatever he was doing. She started hugging me, thanking me. One thing led to another. I told her I was going to take her home and she said she didn't want to go home right that, right that minute. We'd driven somewhere, I don't know, parked on a lot somewhere. And I, I let her out of the car. I don't know no too much from there on. I need you to tell us why you felt like you had to kill her. Are you afraid she's going to go to your wife? I guess. <laughs> Glenn would plead guilty to the crime and receive life in prison without the possibility of parole. While in court, Glenn would listen to the testimony of Carla's boyfriend, Rodney, as he explains what happened that night over 40 years ago. 
I was, uh, Carla had put her purse behind her head. Did she put her purse behind her head? Behind her head, because okay. it was uncomfortable. Was that, so that would have put the purse between her head and the door frame? Right. Okay. And I was on top of her. I wasn't, you know, not quite to the top of her head or anything. You know, I was like from here down on top of her. And the car door yanked up. Carla's head had fallen back past the edge of the seat and was kind of it was hanging out in the opening past the roof line. And the way I was positioned, I kind of fell with her. And what happened next? When my head then, as I fell forward, was just open target. And he was able to come down on the back of my head with, with the force that, you know. When you let go of her a little bit. I had let go, and I believe at that time, Carla had raised up upright into the seat, and I had pushed myself back away from the, the car, you know, the, the, the roof line. And it was such an intense ringing. <clears throat> I was totally stunned, and I just, I couldn't move. I pushed myself up. And the blood was flowing, and I was just staring straight ahead. Do you rem did you find out at some point when this part was going on what it was that had struck you in the head? Not until <clears throat> the last few moments. What, how was it that you discovered what it was that was had struck you in the head? Because he had stuck his arm with the pistol into the car, inches from my forehead. His face wasn't down <clears throat> below the car line. I'm sure he was doing that purposely, where, no, where I could not see him. And he pulled the trigger three times. And all I heard were the three clicks. And so when he pulled the trigger, nothing came out of the gun? Nothing. Nothing came out of the gun. Um, you mentioned before you were able to see a figure as as they walked away. Describe two steps. That's all I saw. Two. That's all I can remember. And Carla turned her face to me, and I can I can visualize and said, "Roddy, go get Dad. Go get my." Dad. If you have found this video informative, then please think about subscribing. Thank you for watching, and I will see you next time here on the Red Tree Crime YouTube channel.